we are here to talk about the Everson Museum of Art, who is my employer. And the Everson, if you're not intimately familiar with it, is the grandfather, or actually more ac accurately, it would be the grandmother um, of studio ceramic collections when it comes to museums in the United States. And that's because of two incredible strong women who really um, built the Eberson's reputations when it came to ceramics. The first is Adelaide Robineau, whose scarab vase is always on display at the Everson. It took her 1,000 hours to decorate, and it will blow your mind when you come to visit us. And the other is Anna Olmsted, who is in awe of Adelaide Robineau and founded the Ceramics Nationals in 1932, and those ran up through about 1972. And you're going to learn a little bit more about what came after. Um, so my name is Garth Johnson. I am the Paul Phillips and Sharon Sullivan Curator of Ceramics at the Eberson. And it's important to say that title because those donors stepped forward just recently and gave $4.8 million to the Eberson to make sure that ceramics always had a place at the table at the Eberson. So our collection is the home to your teachers. It is the home to your teacher's teacher's work. So make the pilgrimage. Come visit us. So on to our uh, panelists, uh, DJ Hellerman is the Curator of Art and Programs at the Everson. He's a native of Ohio, and DJ began curating and educating people about art while helping Progressive Insurance build a collection of contemporary art designed to encourage innovation and change. Prior to his time at the Everson, DJ was the Curator and Director of Exhibitions at Burlington City Arts. Hellerman received his MA in Art History from Case Western Reserve University and his BA in English and Philosophy from Lake Erie College. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my predecessor uh, at the museum, Margie Hudo, who served as the curator. Um, and she holds a BS from the State University of New York at Buffalo and an MFA in Ceramics from Cranbrook. She joined the faculty of Syracuse University in 1971, where she currently is a professor of ceramics at the university's College of Visual and Performing Arts. From 1971 to 1981, Huda worked at the Everson as curator of ceramics, and she's an elected member of the International Academy of Ceramics and has been the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award in 2001. So take it away, DJ and Margie. Exploring the essence of the sensuous earth, fascinated with fire, enraptured with water. The Everson Museum of Art's exhibition, A Century of Ceramics in the United States, 1878 to 1978, opened to the public with huge fanfare. 
In addition to a groundbreaking catalog, Philip Morris Incorporated sponsored a 30-minute documentary that was originally aired on public television, and the opening clip is what you just watched. The documentary contains over-the-top narration by Orson Welles and documents the exhibition at the Everson, as well as the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. Throughout our lecture, we'll show clips taken from this documentary to add texture and a little bit of content. And just as a teaser, we'll even show a clip of a stage collaboration between the artist Peter Volkus and a scantily clad flamenco dancer. So hang on. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is DJ Hellerman, and I am the Curator of Art and Programs at the Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, and I'm joined by artist, curator, and professor Margie Hudo. For the first part of this talk, I'm going to speak about the Everson's history with ceramics, starting in 1916 and moving through 1981. Margie will join in as I discuss three projects, New Works in Clay, Nine West Coast Clay Sculptors, and A Century of Ceramics, to share her personal experiences working on the exhibitions and with the artists. We'll try to keep it as entertaining and informational as possible. As we prepare this lecture, I wanted to keep pumping in information in the presentation, and Margie just kept saying, show them more pictures, and then you don't have to say anything. <laughs> so we're gonna see what kind of balance we were able to strike. Um, the Everson is an institution dedicated to modern and contemporary American art. <clears throat> we were founded in 1897 as the Syracuse Museum of Fine Arts and operated with that name until we became the Everson Museum of Art with the opening of this, our IM Pay building, in 1968. In 1911, the Syracuse Museum of Fine Art was the first institution in the country to dedicate itself to collecting American art. At that time, most institutions were looking to Europe, so it was a pretty bold institutional agenda. The history of ceramics at the Everson dates to the middle of World War I to 1916, when the then director, Fernando Carter, purchased 32 porcelain works by arts and crafts pioneer Adelaide Alsop Robino. Admittedly, this did not come without some prompting from Robino herself. In 1916, Robino wrote a letter to the museum, and at that time, Robino was already considered one of the great ceramic artists in the world, and she had one question for her hometown museum. Syracuse she wrote, has at least two unique boasts to make. There is the salt, which gives its savor, and there are the Robino porcelains. She wanted to know why her work hadn't been purchased and displayed in her hometown, Syracuse. So Robino reportedly gave the museum a significant discount, and thus began the Everson's commitment to ceramics. Robino's scarab vase, or the apotheosis of the toiler, by and large the most coveted Robino porcelain, which is dated 1910, was not a part of the objects acquired in 1916, and entered the collection later upon her death. Here you can see Robino's mark as our registrar Karen holds the scarab vase up to the light. You can see how thin the porcelain is. And if you scan Instagram, you might find fetish images like this. <laughs> Robino studied ceramics with Charles Binns at Alfred University, and in 1899, she married Samuel Robino, a French ceramics expert who was formerly the editor of Old China Magazine. Also in 1899, Robino and Samuel moved to Syracuse and launched Ceramics Studio, a periodical for potters and ceramic artists that published until 1919. In 1917, Syracuse University conferred upon Robino the degree of Doctor in Ceramic Sciences, from 1920 until 1929, she was the first woman employed as professor of ceramics at Syracuse University. On February 18th of 29, at the age of 64, Rabineau passed away. Just nine months after her passing, on November 18th of 1929, Joseph Breck and the Metropolitan Museum of Art opened a memorial exhibition featuring 71 examples of Rabineau's porcelain work. In 1932, in Robineau's honor, the Everson director, Anna Wetherell Olmsted, initiated the first annual Ceramics National Exhibition. And here you can see an image of the journal Olmsted kept with amazing details about the show. One of Olmsted's key goals with the Ceramic National Exhibition was to put ceramics on the map as a, quote, standalone discipline. This is a little known secret. Here is an image taken from Old Olmsted's journal that's stored in our archives at the museum. The exhibition started during the Depression, and not surprisingly, the installation budgets were extremely tight. To help lower installation expenses, the Marcellus Casket Company, which was based in Syracuse, let the museum borrow the boxes they used to ship caskets. What for? Those boxes, with linen over top, transformed into amazing pedestals. And as Olmsted writes in her journal, no one was the wiser. The Ceramic National was a medium-specific, 
and democratic from its inception. The National was juried with an open call for entries rather than a tightly controlled uh, curated exhibition. The exhibition became an overwhelming success and in 1937, the Fifth National traveled internationally. After a stop at the Whitney Museum, the show continued on to Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. Significant corporate sponsorship allowed for purchase awards, which was primarily responsible for amassing the Eversons collection. And Jenny Sorkin's live form, Women, Ceramics, and Community, published in 2016, she writes about the power and prestige of being included in the National. Quote, indeed, exhibiting and winning prizes at the Ceramic National was a mark of excellence and a career builder, helping artists to achieve national recognition and place in invitation-only ceramic exhibitions at major institutions throughout the country. The Nationals were exhibitions where new talent was discovered and old talent was reaffirmed. In select cases, the Ceramic National was fully career anointing, Sorkin adds. The most innovative and influential potter of the post-war period, Peter Volkus, had his work discovered at the National in 1949, when he was still an undergraduate. Volkus's later work was divisive. It was destructive, didn't conform to typical scale conventions, and he insisted on an artistic vocabulary for a medium that revered technique and skill as proof of mastery. Volkus's distancing from functional pottery was extremely controversial, as we're discussing an era when craft and fine art were decidedly and emphatically separate disciplines. The growing divide between Clay's craft and Clay's fine art was acknowledged by the organizers of the National in 1952, when they divided awards into two categories, one category for pottery and another for ceramic sculpture. The Ceramic National was suspended for the duration of World War II, and beginning in 1954, it shifted to a biennial format. In the off year, the exhibition would travel to venues across the country. Gradually, the Nationals became dated, and Syracuse, just as other post-industrial American cities, did not fare well economically as American manufacturing began to cross the ocean. 1968 was an important year. It was the 25th anniversary of the Ceramic National, and it promised to be the most high profile yet. Adding to the excitement <clears throat> was the opening of this building, the Everson Museum of Art, I.M. Pei's first museum in the United States, but let's be honest. <laughs> Compared to the three or 400 entries received when the Nationals began, in 1972, the Everson received an overwhelming 4,000 entries. The jurors, Jeff Schlanger, Robert Turner, and Peter Volkus determined this was no way to assemble an exhibition. The format didn't make sense to them, and for Jim Harithis, the director of the Everson at that time, it was evident the Ceramic National had run its course and he made the bold and dramatic decision to cancel the 26th Ceramic National. For Herethus and the jurors, the for, it was, they were aligned, the format needed to change. Culturally, the United States was thirsty for innovation, the new and the experimental, and if the Everson was going to continue on its path of shifting ceramics from an association with labor and industry to the arena of high art, the medium-specific exhibition needed to change. To accomplish this, Herethus teamed up with artist, curator, and professor Margie Hudo who, from 1973 until 1982, worked as a curator of ceramics at the Everson. Margie's work has included major museums, corporate, private collections, including the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the Albright Knox in Buffalo, at the Everson, and at the Renwick Gallery in the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. In 1982, Margie was exhibiting with the historic Andre Emmerich Gallery, an influential Manhattan art dealer whose gallery was an early champion of the 1950s and 1960s school of color field painting. In addition to the color field painters like Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan, Emmerich represented David Hockney, Sam Francis, Anthony Caro, and Al Held. Emmerich mounted shows featuring the work of a number of women artists, including Helen Frankenthaler, Beverly Pepper, Miriam Shapiro, and Margie Hudo. Clearly, Margie's had a significant career and as an artist and professor, but it is lesser known fact that during her tenure as a ceramics curator at the Everson, she built a series of world-class exhibitions that are significantly underrecognized for their scope, originality, and contributions to both the history of ceramics and contemporary art. You're driving me crazy. <laughs> I'm nervous. All right, the exhibitions. In the aftermath, everybody else is above me. You're in front of me. Okay. My male pattern baldness is probably shown. All right. 
So these are the exhibitions we're going to talk about. Um, in the aftermath of the Ceramic Nationals, the Everson decided as an institution to focus on making exhibitions that would have a particular focus. So they would be of historical nature, innovative exhibitions, or one person or small group shows that would present special insights and recognition to ceramic artists and their work. New Works in Clay. New Works in Clay was a three-part exhibition series in partnership with the Everson and the Syracuse, in Syracuse University. The goal was for New Works in Clay to be a vehicle for discovery in the clay medium. The works were to reflect a new vision, new uses of the material, and new freedom in its, hand, in its handling. It was decidedly not a repetition of other clay exhibitions happening at the same time. In the aftermath of the 1972 cancellation of the Ceramic National, and knowing that painters and sculptors such as Picasso, Gauguin, Miro, David Smith, Jackson Pollock, had dabbled in ceramics, Hudo proposed an exhibition that would arrange for the making of clay works by contemporary non-ceramic artists. Ron Kukta began his tenure as the director of the Everson in 1974. And in the foreword to the New Works in Clay catalog, Cook to explain, by late 1974, it seemed time to devise an unorthodox format for our next large ceramic enterprise. By bringing painters and sculptors to ceramics, it was felt that a different kind of talent might contribute imaginative resources and aesthetic suggestions to the subject of clay. The New Works in Clay series began in 1974 with the artists making work, and the, exhibition follow the exhibitions followed between 1976 and 1982. It was on the cutting edge and prefigured alternative art spaces like Clay Works Studio Workshop and the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia. As Jenny Sorkin points out, 1976 was an era for women's cooperatives, and the New Works and Clay series conjoin, co coincided exactly with that alternative space movement that was rooted in women's labor and the co-op ethos. The exhibition received significant funding from the National Endowment for the Arts in the form of two grants one for a craft workshop program, and the other to support the artist in residence program. Syracuse University allowed Margie to transform the entire third floor of the Continental Can Company, a building sold to the university for a dollar and then home of its sculpture department. The format of the exhibition focused on the material of clay, its durability, its pliability, its hardness, its three-dimensionality, its color, and its surface qualities. The term clay was, in, was used intentionally by Kukta. He felt it was more unassuming, it was a more all-encompassing name than ceramics, which had for him the connotations of vases, dishes, or pots. All the artists who participated were well-established in their field, but had little or no experience with clay. An undertaking like New Works in Clay was no small feat. The commitment it took from Margie, the staff, the students was acknowledged by Kukta and Margie had to set aside making her own work for the two years it took to produce New Works in Clay 1, and that says nothing about the exhibition 2 or 3. One recurring visitor to New Works in Clay in Syracuse was the renowned New York critic Clement Greenberg. Greenberg took a strong interest in the program. He was already interested in, the most, partic in most of the participating artists painting um, and thought that their transition to clay was particularly intriguing. Now, Margie will discuss working with a few of the artists. Ready? Thank you. The New Works in Clay projects from 1974 to 1982 included a little over 30 artists. And we've selected nine artists to give you some view into how these artists, many who had never worked in clay, went about making the artwork. We see in the painting by Helen Frankenthaler, a color field painter from and this painting is from the time period that she came to work with us at the Syracuse Clay Institute. Many times the visiting artists tried to do in clay what they did in their major medium. So Helen discussed making great big areas of clay, four by eight feet, which she could then uh, pour slip on, put stains on, and she referred to these as her clay mattresses. Um, and you can see here, she kind of rolled up a corner. And then I uh, talked with Helen about these things had to fit into the kiln, so she needed to cut them up. <laughs> so she uh, asked how big, and then she took the fettling knife and she created kind of a secondary drawing. 
Interestingly enough, they also, um, once they came out in the bisque form, they liked them in the bisque form. They did not elect to put any other glaze on, as you can see in these final pieces, one of which she edited a little bit. But again, you can see the, you know, the simple staining. She used a simple uh, palette, never used more than four colors. We also worked on some tall, uh, got some big uh, chimney kind of uh, brick things that she stained and painted. So students signed up for this class and worked with these artists. So here's another stained uh, four foot piece that she did. Larry Poons is another one of the color field painters and this is what his painting looked like at the time of the show. And Larry's way of working was to put uh, his canvas is on the wall and he paint at it. So he asked us to create a room, uh, cover it with cloth, and for a week, we heaved clay at the wall <laughs> with lots of texture. Then he wanted to put slip on it. So we mixed up about three or four 30 gallon pails of slip, uh, some loaded with iron, cobalt, etc. And here's Larry heaving those buckets of colored slip. Every night we, we did the thing of covering up the clay to keep it wet and uh, taking it down and heaving more stuff at it the next day. This went on for about a week. When it was time for Larry to go back to New York, I asked him at the airport um, how he wanted me to cut this up. And he said, just cut it up into two by two foot squares, a grid system. So you can see here the cutting of the grid and then we removed them and we fired them. Uh, I also said to Larry, you know, these things come out a different color. If I fire them under 2,000 degrees, they'll kind of be in pastel. And if I go to 2,200, it will get more earthy. He said, I'll just do it all. So um, here's what part of the wall looked like when it came out under uh, 2,000 degrees. Here's Larry's part of the exhibition. And he never did elect to put the walls back together. Instead, he kept them as separate um, paintings, and Beaverson owns four of these now. Dorothy Hood was an artist I worked with, uh, a painter from um, Houston, and she accepted the invitation to work in ceramics, and she decided to work with the Raku process. So this was the old ceramic facility at SU. There's now a huge um, building that belongs to the physical, uh, you know, the base, the football group. So here we are uh, running Raku with her outdoors and then putting the Raku, the big slab, which was 30 by 30 inches in this con brick container and pouring sawdust in there, which caused incredible flames and flame patterns. And ultimately, uh, this was what the final product looked like. And she had done nine of these that we did with her. And you can see in the exhibition how she uh, decided to ask us to build a platform, put some sand on it, and, uh, and then arrange these in kind of a time memory uh, focus. Anthony Carroll worked with us for six years, came to us over and over. Anthony has been described as the sculptor who took, who took sculpture off the pedestal and put it directly on the ground. And you see that the work was very linear at the time. So, However, when he got into clay, it became another whole ball game. And we spent three days just making a lot of clay parts. We threw on the wheel, we made slabs, we coiled, and then he had a room full of uh, parts, elements, as he referred to them. And he would walk around and pick up an element and put it down and then go get another one and another one. And then our, uh, so we were there to help him score and slip, put them together make sure they stood up. And often he would use uh, bricks that were laying around or whatever to hold them up. And then uh, later he would like the bricks and they would become a part of the work. He did talk a lot about how the clay liked to fold in on itself. So uh, he also liked the clay with nothing else on it. Just leave it as it came out of the kiln and the firing. And um, you can see they are kind of uh, raw and, and expressionistic. It left a huge impact on the future of his work with metal. Billy L. Bengston was a painter from the West Coast, 
And at the time Billy was doing these paintings, he called uh, the Iris series or the Dracula series. And Billy actually, when he had a chance to do whatever he wanted, selected making a dinner set for himself. So uh, we set him up to work with uh, Syracuse China. And uh, he designed these plates. Uh, he wanted a plate that he could put a steak on, another plate for a salad, and the cup and saucer were for uh, espresso coffee that he liked. And um, they had a lot of fun with him at Syracuse China. Uh, it was kind of really different. They didn't usually make plates that had a lot of tight corners on them. And he had them paint, or they sprayed a black glaze on these, and then he had two stencils. One would hit the black and get sprayed, and then a second one. And then he asked the workers to just free brush some marks on there which drove the workers crazy. And what do you mean, just put brush strokes anywhere? But it did leave a very interesting and uh, final uh, effect. You can see the free brush strokes, you see them there? Kind of fun. They decided they, they were not going to be useful for the restaurant industry. Those corners would get knocked off very soon from the waiters <laughs> and so on. In New Works and Clay 2 and 3, uh, we had some funding from the New York State Council, et cetera. And we, we added not only painters and sculptors, but people that worked in video or photography, um, computer, et cetera. And uh, Mary Frank had done a little clay, but she was primarily known as a painter and a drawer. And uh, beautiful drawing. She had been drawing since she was five years old. Uh, so we prepared a series of clay slabs for her. We prepared a black clay body, and you can see one of her uh, painterly drawings. Very beautiful the way she would reach under that slab and push up a body part. She brought with her a surgeon's scalpel and all those lines were drawn with the the surgeon's scalpel and uh, very beautiful piece. This piece is about four feet wide and she wanted uh, this leaper to be standing up and I thought it was very clever how she finished the back of this. And this is a low fire salt glaze about cone four. Um, she continued to do a series of these women who I call the women who sit in the grass and have the sun coming on them. Uh, and you can see how beautifully, you know, you give her a slab and then how she'd cut it and manipulate it and how they would go together. Uh, this one was called The Swimmer. He's about eight feet long and I was told that later this was acquired by the Whitney Museum. And then this is the piece the Everson owns called The Horse and Rider. Kenneth Noland also worked with us in both Newark Sinclair 2 and 3, and he's known for his targets, but most uh, Ken is known for these very striped paintings, which he was doing roughly about the time that he came with it to us. So he wanted to do a series of work that incorporated stripes, and so we colored a whole bunch of porcelain and piled it up into strips and then cut it with the uh, wire. And he said, ah, oh, that looks like chunks of bacon. And uh, he'd pick up the chunks of bacon and embed it in the uh, stoneware. And then uh, we gave him some glazed crystals and chunks of glass, which he embedded. Later, he's the only one that elected to use some glaze. And he had me just put on a clear glaze and then asked me to fire that slab standing up and um, letting the glaze drip so that it would form a kind of plaid format over the uh, surface. This piece was about three by four feet. Uh, he also, he always talked about format. So we had a series from him that had a circular format. We had another format where we did all the drawing and painting in a corner. And we did use both stoneware. You see him working here on the circular format. Miriam Shapiro, uh, came to us also, and she's known as one of the women who, for a lot of feminist art, like Judy Chicago, and this is typical of um, her work, which had a lot of reference to quilts and so on. And so when she came to us, we also cut up a lot of colored clay and put it together to uh, have much the, the same feeling as her uh, paintings did. We also included ceramic artists, artists who could come and maybe do something with us with 
a staff, you know, all the students, and make something they wouldn't ordinarily do in their own studio. So John Glick came to the studio and uh, decided, and here is the work which I'm sure many of you recognize. We used one of his plates on the cover of the Century Book, and, uh, and then you see another one of his pieces who, where he did a lot of his beautiful brushwork and layering of, gla of glazes. These were two of the tiles that were about 20 by 22 by 22 inches, and he used his slips and uh, salt glazes, and these were all fired in the salt kiln, which he didn't have in his own practice. Currently, we're trying to do some more new works in clay at Syracuse University, and two summers ago, we had T.R. Erickson come to us, who was having a big exhibition at the Everson, and uh, he wanted in the show to include urns that would have the cremated ashes of his mother, grandmother, and grandfather. And one of our graduate students, Quan Jung, uh, was willing to work with him to um, create the urn. So you see Tom and Quan uh, working on the urn shapes. And these were the various urn shapes that were created and bisked, and then it came time to glaze them and fire them out on our kiln patio with the raku process. And uh, I had Tom try a lot of the raku glazes, and in the end he used white. And like artists who've never been trained in clay, they do something you wouldn't expect. And he just put his hands in the white raku glaze and smeared it on the pot, <laughs> and that was the way it got glazed. And here they are in the exhibit with um, his relatives' ashes. All right, the next exhibition we'll talk about is Nine West Coast Clay Sculptures from 1978. <clears throat> Just a brief 40 or so years ago, on September 29th of 1978, Nine West Coast Clay Sculptures, curated by Margie Hudo and Judy Schwartz, opened at the Everson. Like New Works in Clay, this was another exhibition that emerged at a pivotal moment in the development of American ceramics. For seven years prior to his tenure at the Everson, Ron Kukta served as curator at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art in California. Because of the Everson's commitment to American clay and Ron's awareness of the importance of the California art scene, Kukta encouraged Margie to assemble a West Coast ceramics exhibition. The focus of the exhibition was to present a selection of the best ceramic sculpture done in the preceding five years by West Coast artists. It paired well-recognized artists with artists newer to the West Coast clay scene. With its beginnings rooted in the mid-50s, West Coast ceramic sculpture had been labeled abstract expressionist clay, and in the 60s, the label funk was applied to the work, mostly an unpopular term from its first application by Peter Sells in 1965. Other adjectives that Hudo cited as being used to describe the work were ugly, useless, senseless, bizarre, sensual, erotic, offensive, primitive, fun, humorous, and unbelievable. Ceramics in the 1950s were heavily vessel-oriented, stoneware and earthy. Exhibitions like this marked a shift. The particular West Coast artists that Margie selected for the exhibition utilized materials and techniques which were not then considered appropriate to the art and craft of studio pottery. As Margie wrote in the catalog, Quote, the artist made use of low fire, brightly colored glazes and metallic lusters, decals and lettering, which in ceramic art circles at the time brought to mind dime store souvenir items. As we look at this work, we might still use the adjectives unbelievable, humorous, fun, exciting, but we would also use the word strength, power, and even elegance. Margie noted that the work she selected for the exhibition <clears throat> ignored the traditional principles of ceramics in terms of form, content, craftsmanship, to give a new thought to clay, and in doing so, refine the medium. She wrote, by transforming ceramics into a sculptor's medium and extending the role of painting on clay, abstract expressionists and funk ceramics destroyed the standard distinction between art and craft. This press release, taken from our archive files on the exhibition shows evidence of the shifting use of language and in what is presumably Margie's handwriting at the very top, you can see her attempt, like everyone else in the field, to renegotiate how to talk about and accurately describe who is making what and what that thing is being used for. The description, artist working in clay, was crossed out and changed to sculptors. 
The artists featured in the exhibition felt free to disregard traditional modes of ceramic expression and would use paint instead of glaze or use glue to construct their pieces. The artists were not constrained by the need for the work to be utilitarian, and along with that, the possibility for diversity of expression suddenly became endless. In 1981, three years after Nine West Coast Clay Sculptors opened at the Everson, the Whitney Museum staged an exhibition that is strikingly similar to Margie's exhibition. Titled Ceramic Sculpture, Six Artists, the show at the Whitney included the work of Robert Arneson, David Gilhooly, John Mason, Ken Price, Richard Shaw, and Peter Volkus. Basically, take, the sh take Judy and Margie's exhibition, Nine West Coast Clay Sculptors, drop the women, and drop Middlebrook for John Mason. Initially, the work in the Whitney exhibition was not well received by East Coasters, and that's to put it lightly. Hilton Kramer, then art critic for the New York Times, wrote a review where he described the work of Arneson, Gilhooly, and Shaw as celebrating, quote, kitsch, low taste, visual gags, fastidious narrative, and certain vein of sophomoric humor, more or less akin to pop art ethos of the 1960s. And my favorite passage from Kramer, we're left brooding about the thinness and spiritual impoverishment of the cultural life that has sustained this movement. We are left, in short, with some dark thoughts about the fate of high art in the California sun. <laughs> with Peter Volkus and Robert Arneson, we start to see the artists presented at Nine West Coast Clay Sculptors as the beginning of a distinctly American ceramic sculpture movement. Beyond the influence of abstract expressionism, funk, and pop art, the work in nine West Coast clay sculptors was clearly influenced by ideas of surrealism, illusionism, trompe l'oeil, superrealism, minimalism, and conceptualism. All the work presented in nine West Coast clay sculptors was incredibly versatile. It was funny, smart, and masterfully executed. And as Judy Schwartz concluded her catalog essay, quote, it is within the spirit of individualism and uniqueness that the nine artists in the show made their contribution. Margie's going to discuss the artists that were included in the show, but first we'll begin with this amazing video of Peter Volkus. Peter Volkus, who has been the most radical force in adjusting the Western perception of the vessel, introduced a symmetrical form as a provocative, energetic treatment of the surface. I, I become very proud when it comes to my work because I deal with myself still. I came out of a painting background, you know, I'm trying to paint, I'm having a difficult time, I find clay. You concentrate on that ball of mud, it's this big, and you keep that thing moving until you can relate to it. And then I have to work with it, you know, I have to expand on it. And this is what I'm interested in, I'm interested in a head trip. I'm not interested, I don't allow people to make functional wear in my class. I throw it out, I just throw it out. I don't teach them about art. I'm trying to teach them about themselves. I'm trying to teach them about form. And if they don't understand form, they can't make decisions. I want them to get to the point where they can make decisions, and then they can be free. I'm going to go right down here. I listen to a lot of music. I come and go. Half the time, I, I, I sit around listening to cowboy music. But well enough, I listen to flamenco, which is a sort of a gypsy uh, cowboy shit, you know, like it's playing now. That's the box. That's what I listen. My energies come from a lot of different areas. I, I travel around my truck. I look at machinery. I look at this and that. That, that interests me. I look at other artwork. Um, what I'm doing is gathering information, you know, visually, through my ears, and taking all these sensibilities into account, you know. I work with students, with people, and when it comes to the point when I have to let all that go, then I have to do so. It gets down to the point where I have to make art, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Volkus's six clay drawings seen here in the exhibition were an extension of a group that he created during the period of 1973 to 78. 
While curating the exhibition in 1977, my co-curator, Judy Schwartz, and I visited his studio, where he had a series of these newly thrown and wet plates on the floor of his studio. He explained that the glazing would be just a slight gloss on the surface. This group were 22 to 24 inches in diameter. Compared to the earlier clay drawings, he had broadened the gestures across the surface of the clay. We see the freedom, intensity, and force of pushing and pulling the clay around, contrasted by a highly controlled subdued glazed surface. The glaze, which is barely there, enhances the surface and does not mask the vigor of the work. He told me he was just gonna spray it with a light, light spray of culminite. Uh, the two vessel forms are a counterpoint to the clay drawings and engender the same energies, but in the round. Stephen DeStabler's artworks are also an expression of love for the material and its inherent qualities. When we visited his studio in 1977, these works were also in progress and laying on the floor of his studio. It was very interesting to see how he built them first laying down on the floor and then cutting them so they could be stacked in vertical as vertical sculptures. It is clear in these pieces that we see in the exhibition that he is preoccupied with time and earth. His surface and color treatments evoke the impression of weathering surfaces which appear to have withstood the passage of eons. The viewer feels like some archaeologist standing in awe at the monumentality and significance of these forms. They personify man's existence on earth as timeless and the constant circle of life and death. Wrap for Arneson, the message, the idea, the content of the piece is paramount. Common everyday situations, or most commonly himself, are presented with visual and verbal punning in such a way that they may be expanded, exposed, or exaggerated. Usually intellectual interplays are created between the object and the title, enabling new insights and understanding about the event or the artist himself. Hence, five splat. <laughs> the work in the exhibition included the mountain and lake, which he could see near his home, and figurative sculptures, usually of himself as the subject. At the time, his use of low fire glazes and colors were not easily accepted. He saw the pun as basically a tool to guide the viewer into a deeper examination of a rather wide range of human emotions. The mountain and lake are in the Everson collection, and we often have it out. Uh, his concerns as an artist are serious. They deal with emotion, ranging from unabashed laughter to profound dismay, as in the fragment of Western civilization seen here. At the time I saw Karen's work in 1977, I found the work rather disturbing and highly unusual in that she was incorporating various mixed materials. For most of us who came through a ceramic education, we usually pursued rather traditional clay and glaze techniques. The work like Arneson's was also driven by personal narratives. From the catalog, her work acts as a diary of conscious and subconscious events and is often surrealistic. Her dreams, as psychoanalytic records, become major statements. Animal forms are traits she finds disturbing, both as a feeling individual and as a feminist. Humor, when present, is biting. She had the ability to combine, combine the materials, as you see here, acrylic paints, sequins, like on his tie, ropes, wigs, etc., which create visually dramatic impressions. I think this is particularly apparent in Pig Boss, which we had to plug in because his cigar lit up. And uh, in, the steak, in the snake charmer, you can see with his wig and rope, and oh, those eyes. <laughs> David Gahuli created ceramic artworks inspired by fantasy and storytelling. He discovered early in college that he could pursue his multidiscipline fascinations, which were anthropology, marine biology, religion, social, and political thought. More realistically as a major in ceramic art than he could trying to juggle all the others together. 
Consequently, Gilhuli fabricated in clay a framework of mythological animals, primarily frogs, to comment upon and satirize man and his cosmos. He developed a personal account of a frog world, a world having its own history, events, and folk heroes, which coincidentally, mysteriously, resemble our own. As seen in the artworks, he used commercial products and low fire hobby glazes to get the effects he wanted. Some of the pieces included actual sesame seeds and poppy seeds on their surfaces. For the opening of the exhibition, he asked me to rub garlic all over garlic bread frog, so there would also be the element of smell as you walk through the exhibition. <laughs> As a young man growing up in Los Angeles, Ken Price was markedly influenced by the folk pottery he saw in Mexico. We see in this slide one of his famous cup pieces. But in 1974 and into 1975, Price's interest in Mexican pottery led him to envision a curio shop. By 1976, he began to conceive the configuration of many units or cabinets each containing from eight to 20 or more objects. The project reached its culmination in 1977, and the opportunity to exhibit Happy's Curios arose. We were able to include this body of work in nine West Coast clay sculptors. Each sculpture has a unity and particular inspiration incorporating such aspects as Mexican cliches, death, male-female implications, visual symmetries, and an appearance of a long and nameless ancestry. Marilyn Levine is often described as an ultra-realist. She used clay reinforced with nylon fibers and rolled thin slabs of clay between uh, two pieces of saran wrap. These were then used like leather to produce objects made originally from leather. Thus, for example, she created shoes, briefcases, suitcases, and purses with such remarkable, remarkable realism that people often went to touch her work to make sure if it was clay. I had to keep that guard handy as people went on whenever they could get near the work. It was, in fact, this conflict between visual and tactile that primarily interested her. And to quote her, the conflict between visual and tactile clues disturbs one's sense of reality with the result that one's relationship to the object can no longer be the same. The shoulder bags, for example, which were included in the exhibition, are full of trace in that they show the scuff in use. They are narratives which tell you something about the owner. David Middlebrook calls himself a surrealist and seeks to restructure our perception of the world by undermining a rational view of how things are to be. Thus, his constructions serve to defy the laws of gravity or may be grossly out of scale or distorted. This forces a new perception on the part of the viewer. Color and texture became increasingly important to his work. He tried to develop appropriate surfaces and a palette for this work in the exhibition. He wanted to move away radically in the technique and appearance from traditional ceramic sculpture. Shaw says about his de development and ideas, being in the right place at the right time had a great deal of influence on my career. In 1963, clay was heading in a definite direction, away from functional pots and the big abstract clay sculptures. As a student, I had dealt with abstract painting. At this time, I began to transfer my painting ideas to pottery and ceramic sculpture. My ideas dealt with images, objects, scale, space, realism, and humor. In 1978, he was still dealing with some of these same problems. The works are provocative still lives and can be viewed as such. Thank you. Your turn, DJ. <laughs> All right. The final exhibition we're going to talk about is A Century of Ceramics in the United States, <clears throat> 1878 to 1978. A Century of Ceramics in the United States, or the Century Show, as Margie likes to call it. Um, by the mid-1970s, there was a growing need to have a large survey exhibition focusing on the development of ceramics in the United States. In, December of 19, in the December 1978 issue of Ceramics Monthly, <clears throat> the potter 
and writer Elaine Levine declared, the recognition contemporary work has achieved owes a debt to yesterday's accomplishments, and Levine called for a better understanding <coughs> of the history of ceramics. In Sequoia Miller's The Ceramic Presence in Modern Art, he writes, Levine's challenge was answered the following year when a century of ceramics in the United States opened on May 5th of 79 at the Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, New York. <coughs> American achievement in ceramic art has been surveyed in this long overdue exhibition organized by the Everson Museum of Art Everson. in Syracuse, New York. An exciting <laughs> retrospective of enormous scope and consequence. The significance of this exhibition, a century of ceramics in the United States, 1878 to 1978, is that it brings together, it documents for the first time, 100 rather glorious years of progress in the development of a ceramic art aesthetic in the United States, brings together many of those pioneers who have created a unique American art form out of this particular expression that man has created out of earth, fire and water. The Century Show was received with resounding acclaim and was reviewed in the January 1981 issue of Art in America by Donald Cuspit, where he wrote, an exhibition devoted to the history of American pottery debunks the notion that ceramics is a populist craft with no high art aspirations. It also suggests that because ceramic art emphasizes both sight and touch, it may in fact be the quintessentially modernist art form. Cuspit in the article summarized the development of American ceramics by dividing it into three phases. Oops. Oh, yeah, yeah, fine. There we go. First, surface is more important than shape. Second, shape is more important than surface. And third, the fully modernist phase, surface and shape are one. Cuspit concludes, American ceramics have come a long way from the days when it was scornfully regarded as a woman's art. Until recently, however, ceramics have lived in the shadow of painting and sculpture. But, now it has been realized that there are no privileged modes of art and that the ceramic material, while frequently considered the sculpture medium of last resort, is also the medium which makes self-evident the fundamental tensions that inform art. Co-curated with Garth Clark, the exhibition was organized chronologically by decade. The Century Show featured more than 400 objects and just over 100 artists. E.P. Dutton published a 400-page book, which has been a major reference for museum curators, collectors, educators, and artists. The exhibition was accompanied by a symposium, which the art critic Clement Greenberg and Garth Clark delivered keynote lectures. With tremendous success, the Century Show went on to tour the United States for more than two years, with stops in New York City, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Chicago, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Washington, D.C. And here's the closing segment of the Century of Ceramics documentary. Oh, that's Garth, a young Garth Clark, for those of you who know <laughs> Garth. <laughs> American ceramic art is going to be a very exciting one because the American ceramist has been able to introduce a, a whole new vocabulary in terms of handling clay. Up until now and largely for the last three centuries, the Western view of ceramics has been largely to make it through the eye and the mind. With the American ceramist, we see a greater trust of the body. There's a physical response. There's an intuition. There's what Harold Rosenberg calls an unfocused play with material that has taken ceramics from the applied art and made it a very important contribution to the fine arts, to the cultural heritage of this country. Two years ago at Inseca in Portland, Elizabeth Dunbar, our executive director, and I presented on our ideas for reinvigorating the Everson's institutional commitment to the acquisition, presentation, and interpretation of ceramics today. We titled that lecture, The Everson Strikes Back. Since then, we've remodeled and dedicated our ceramics galleries and significantly increased our acquisition activity. 
Last year, it was a spoiler. We welcomed none other than Garth Johnson as our Paul Phillips and Sharon Sullivan curator of ceramics. Currently on view at the Everson is Garth's exhibition, Key Figures, which examines the larger than life artists who shaped the history of figurative ceramics. The exhibition features works from the Everson's historic collection by artists like Victor Schreckengoss, Idris Eckhart, and Waylon Gregory, as well as select works from a new generation of artists like Alessandra Gallo, Adelaide Paul, and Christina Cordova, who are building on this legacy by using the figure to explore identity, narrative, and allegory. We're excited to break ground this fall on a construction project that will result in a cafe at the Everson. With the support of Louise Rosenfield, the Everson will open a, a cafe dedicated exclusively to the use of functional ceramics from the, from the Rosenfield collection. In 1971, the Everson opened Yoko Ono's first solo museum titled, This Is Not Here. This fall, to celebrate the, e the museum's 50th anniversary, we're excited to welcome Yoko back to the Everson for Yoko Ono remembering the future. In conjunction with the exhibition, Garth will be assembling a group exhibition exploring the use of conceptual ceramics. The exhibition will be titled Earth Peace, after Yoko's artwork, Earth Peace, and will include work by artists like Judy Chicago, Ai Weiwei, and Yoko. Thanks so much for being here. We hope you're going to come and visit us in Syracuse soon.